Major funding for this program has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding has been provided by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Jacob and Charlotte Lerman Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Ever since William of Normandy boldly conquered England in 1066, the Norman kings of the realm had sought to solidify their power over all of Britain. They met a particularly brave and stubborn foe in the Welsh, who steadfastly refused to submit to any English monarch. Tapestries and medieval illuminations tell of a line of kings who for more than 200 years tried without success to bring Wales into the English nation. They tell many stories of pitched battles and fierce struggle. And they tell of the coming of Edward I, a king of power and vision. Edward saw that the key to victory in hostile Wales lay in English castles, manned by English troops and controlled by loyal barons. Which is why, on March the 27th, 1283, King Edward invested Kevin Lestrange as Lord of Aberwyvern in agriculturally rich but rebellious Northwest Wales. The king's first charge to Lord Kevin, build a castle there, the finest that modern engineering could produce. There never really was a place called Aberwyvern, or a baron called Lord Kevin Lestrange. I made them up. But the rest of the story is quite true. And here's the proof. This is the Castle Conway, built some 700 years ago. I first saw the Welsh castles on summer holidays with my parents. I found them big, dark, and mysterious. I remember peeking into all their murky chambers, running along the passages and racing up every spiral staircase, two steps ahead of my sister. She remembers it slightly differently. When I grew older, I often thought of those childhood experiences and romantic visions. But eventually, I began asking some basic questions. How were these castles built and why? So I decided to find out. I returned to Wales to visit a few of my old haunts and a number of new ones. But this time, when I peeked into those darkened chambers and raced sisterless up to the tops of the towers, I was inventing my own imaginary castle, which I called Aberwyvern. As the story of my castle unfolds, we'll be visiting some of the real castles it's based on and finding out something about the people who lived in and around them. Sharing my interest in history and architecture is Sarah Bullen, who will help me tell the story. Hello, David. Hello, Sarah. Sarah, what interests you most about castles? Actually, I'm more interested in the people, what they were like, how they lived, how and why they were different from us. And they were different, weren't they? Oh, yes. Most of the people were peasants. They were tied to the land they were born on. 
and they never moved more than a few miles away from their homes. They were totally controlled by and dependent upon the lord of the manor. They couldn't count on anything. For instance, the land providing enough to live on. They might find themselves in political or military disputes. Diseases of all kinds were a continual threat, and there were few known cures. But for everyone, rich and poor, survival was the all-consuming effort. If you had lived in the Middle Ages and were fortunate enough to survive birth and childhood, you pretty much knew what you were expected to do for the rest of your life. And only if you were exceptionally bright and industrious could you hope to rise beyond your social origins. After all, you probably couldn't even afford to marry unless you had an inheritance of some sort. And whoever you were, the chances were you would die young. The most important things in life were faith in God and personal obligations. To the church, to the king, perhaps to a guild, and of course to the local lord, such as your Kevin Lestrange. Who, as you'll remember, had just been made Lord of Aber Wyvern and was setting sail for his new fiefdom in Wales. We sailed to the mouth of the River Wyvern. I met there with Master James of Babington, the famous engineer who was already at work on other castles for the king in Wales and Scotland. I hope he proves worth his fee of three shillings a day, an unprecedented sum. I trust you had a pleasant journey, Lord Kevin. Is the journey from London ever a pleasant one? <laughs> Hardly, I dare say. Uh, shall we begin, my lord? It is critical that we be able to command all the surrounding land and control traffic and commerce through the area. After surveying the entire area, my lord, I've decided that the outcrop of rock extending into the water provides the best natural defense. I'm sure a military strategist of your skill will agree. Right, sir. And, of course, the river provides an obvious escape route, uh, should one ever prove necessary. Let us hope to God it does not. At the foot of the outcrop over there, we will lay out the town. And that will provide the first ring of the castle's defense? Hmm. I am very pleased, Master James. Thank you, my lord. His Majesty has impressed upon me the urgency of this project. After all, we are in hostile territory. Carpenters are already building workshops and barracks. And I must say, my lord, the protection of your soldiers provides great comfort indeed. A necessary precaution. We know the Welsh are watching us. Satisfied with the progress, Kevin returned home and reported to his king. Uh, since your last visit, I have laid out the boundaries of the town, which the diggers are trenching so we may build a wall. Master James, what sufficed in King Henry's With time... With due respect, my lord, I have travelled throughout Europe and the Holy Land, studying the great military architecture. Your castle will be the strongest yet seen in the kingdom. I am glad to hear it. It is laid out in defensive rings. The outer curtain wall will measure 300 feet on each of its sides and will be defended by towers and gatehouses. If by any chance, an extremely unlikely one, the attackers succeed in penetrating this area, they will be thwarted by the inner curtain wall, 12 feet thick and 35 feet high, with 50 foot high towers. An intruder would virtually have to fly to get in. That should hold against Prince David and his Welsh rebels. In the center of the inner ward, we have the living quarters for yourself and Lady Catherine, your children and servants. My wife is a particular sort of woman. She will not relish living in this godforsaken outpost. See that you make her quarters as pleasing as possible. You may have my assurance of that, my lord. Over here will be the barracks for the soldiers. Here the great hall and kitchen and storerooms. And uh, here, in the safest part of the castle, will be the well. The castle is only as safe as its water supply. And the town, it will be a simple grid of streets and blocks to be further divided into lots. Very good. 
but the town defences. The three entrances in the town wall will be fortified with double-towered gatehouses. It should prove quite effective. Most impressive. But how fast can the project be built? The stone is being quarried and loaded on ships, some of which have already set sail. But when the stone arrives, to maintain the pace of construction His Majesty demands, I simply must have more workers. And so you shall, Master Jones. Lord Kevin sent constables to several English cities to find the multitude of workers Master James required. Over 500 diggers were forced to march all the way from Lincolnshire. Some local officials grumbled since they had building projects of their own to complete. But Lord Kevin's representatives spoke in the name of King Edward himself. One who was pleased to come was the blacksmith, Andrew, from the town of Chester. There are already many skilled smiths in Chester, so the call for work in Aberwyvern struck me as a fine opportunity. And with Lord Kevin's terms, I become a master straight away without paying any guild fee. It's a chance to establish myself in the new town, build a house and start a family. My Lord Kevin, uh, construction on Aberwyvern Castle is at its height. There are now 3,000 workers on the site, and we have finally secured sufficient master craftsmen to oversee them. In mid-July in this year of our Lord, 1284, we began the outer curtain and the town wall foundation. As I explained to you when we last met, the two stone faces are bound with mortar made of sand and lime. And as the wall grows, the space in between is filled with rubble. Materials are carried up the walls on scaffolding supported by put logs set in holes in the walls themselves. We find this the most efficient means of construction. We use hoists and pulleys to lift lighter materials and tools. You understand, sir, that the windows near the bottom of the walls and towers must be small enough so that an enemy soldier cannot climb through. All the windows will be protected by iron grills and can be closed off by wooden shutters on the inside. In your living quarters, your gracious Lady Catherine will be pleased to note that each window will be fitted with glass. Of course, the tops of the walls will be crenellated with embrasures and uh, merlons. Each merlon will be capped by three fearsome-looking finials. I have provided for arrow loops in the merlons for your archers. With a wedge-shaped recess cut out of the stone, the archer may aim anywhere across his field of vision without exposing himself to the attackers. One of the many refinements that adds up to the greatest castle I or any other Englishman has ever built. When the weather turned cold, the partially completed walls were covered with straw and dung to keep the new mortar from freezing and cracking. And so protected, the castle sat through the winter. It's important to remember that the medieval castle is really a military machine, and every part has a specific function. For instance, crenellations like these at Carnarvon aren't for decoration. As you saw in my imaginary castle at Aberwyvern, they had a practical and deadly purpose. Just like today, I suppose the military minds of the time were constantly trying to come up with improvements. Sure. Look at these advanced arrow loops, arranged in the wall so that an archer could shoot in two directions from the same position. 
And the development of the arrow loop in the first place was certainly an improvement over having to expose yourself to the enemy's fire in order to shoot your own weapon. It's because of improvements like these that Carnarvon, built towards the end of the 13th century, is castle building at its most sophisticated. Before Edward I's time, castles, cathedrals, and other mammoth construction projects had taken generations to build, with long delays when the money ran out. Edward changed all this with his castles. He placed the financial resources of the entire kingdom behind them. He set up a bureaucracy to handle those finances, as well as planning and recruitment. He also expected his lords and barons to bear a large share of the cost. He drafted armies of willing and unwilling workers. And so, instead of taking generations, Edward's castles were built in less than a decade. The earliest English castles were Mott and Bailey fortifications. The Mott was a high mound of earth on which stood a wooden tower. The open space at the base of the Mott was a bailey, and around the top of the Mott and the bailey was a high wooden fence called a palisade. During the early part of the 12th century, these palisaded earthworks were replaced by stone structures. And during the Crusades, the Europeans came up against even stronger and more impressive castles in Syria. That must have been an unpleasant shock. I'm sure it was, but they, they learned well from what they saw. And by the end of the 13th century, many of these Eastern ideas had worked their way into European castles, along with a number of original improvements. Such as? Well, for example, here at Beaumaris on the island of Anglesey is one tremendous improvement over earlier castle designs. You can see that the gatehouse in the outer wall does not line up with the gatehouse to the inner wall. Oh, yes. Now, should an enemy soldier get through the outer gatehouse and make for the inner ward, he couldn't go straight in. He'd have to go diagonally across the defender's field of fire. Exactly. From there, all the way over to here. Now, that bit of strategic genius was the work of one of the great architectural minds of the Middle Ages, Master James of St. George. Ah, whose namesake appears in our story. The very same. In the spring, the workers returned, and construction went along smoothly throughout the summer of 1285. By that fall, many of the towers and sections of the town wall had reached their full height. And in December, when the temperature dropped too low to work with wet mortar, all but a few hundred of the workers once again returned home to their families throughout England. The next year, Master James brought in a hundred extra masons to speed up work on the inner curtain and its towers. As the castle drew nearer completion, timbers were brought from the forests of Dean. Lord Kevin brought his friend, Lord Raymond Le Bouvier, to meet Master James and inspect the progress. Also under obligation to King Edward, Lord Raymond was preparing his own castle to command the northernmost sea route to Wales. There are three rooms in every tower. The lowest one, the basement level, is for storage. In the unlikely event the walls are breached during a siege, each tower may have to defend itself and so must have its own supplies. The upper rooms will be used for living and working space. And this must be your dungeon over here. And it was not finished one day too soon. Just as the trap door was set in the basement floor, my soldiers caught a man stealing lead from Master James's storeroom. I'll warrant your first guest resolved not to pay the dungeon a return visit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a fortress of war. But no castle is complete without a chapel for the worship of God, without whose favor all our efforts are to no avail. Magnificent. Two full stories. Ah, I have scarce seen such beautiful glass or such a noble altar. Ah, I'm deeply moved, Kevin. Uh, this way, please, my lords. The gatehouses are the last major construction for both castle and town defense. Uh, do please watch your footing, my lords. The stairs are not as yet evened.
Uh, since the gatehouses are most vulnerable, I had to design them with great care. First, a heavy timber portcullis can be lowered to block the entrance. And beyond that, a set of wooden doors which cannot be opened when the drawbar is slid into place. Arrow loops in the towers allow the archers to rake and pepper the area. And then, of course, there are murder holes cut into the ceiling through which soldiers above can attack any intruders in the passageway. But that would imply that they could even reach this point. Rather difficult, because the gatehouse defences begin with the drawbridge. The inner end is weighted, and when supports underneath are removed, that end swings down into a pit, lifting the other end high above the moat. Most efficient! And now, my lords, the inner ward, the very heart of the castle. The barracks building is two stories high, with a slate roof. Heaven knows we have plenty of that around here. The frame is erected first, and the spaces between the timbers fill with wattle and door. The soldiers will live on the second floor, and the basement is for stables and many of the castle's weapons. And over there is the armorer's shed. It's been quite a sight seeing these buildings going up around the ward taking the place of our old huts. Those are top rooms, of course. They're there for the Lord and his lady and their noble guests. But even the dogs have the finest of accommodation. I mean, look at them kennels in the east corner. And next to that is the view for Lord Kevin's prized hunting birds. Everything's been thought of. In the castle, you no longer have to go out back when nature calls. There's garderobes built right into the walls. There's a round hole cut into the stone slab, leading right straight down to the cesspit below. Though I'll admit the garderobe isn't the most comfortable place on a cold winter night. <laughs> Your great hall will be here. I placed it in a corner of the inner ward so that only two new walls would be required. We have used the forces of nature to our advantage. A cistern in the tower supplies a sink with running water. It is convenience itself. And the kitchen will prove quite adequate to service the needs of a great household such as yours. Even though castles were designed for military purposes, their living areas were made as comfortable as possible. Remember, window openings on the outside walls had to be kept small so an attacker couldn't get through. The nicer rooms were higher up in the towers, where you could safely have larger windows. Although the walls were eight to 10 feet thick, recesses like this made it easier to enjoy the light. Now, tower rooms for the Lord and Lady, their special guests, and high-ranking officials were quite spacious and rather comfortable by the standard of the day. Large stone fireplaces were built into the walls, which were often hung with beautiful tapestries. Stone corbels jutting out of the walls supported the beams. Normally, they had curtain beds and mattresses stuffed with straw, chairs and dressing tables. A typical tower had three or four rooms, one on top of the other, and each one served a different function. But the most important room in any castle was the Great Hall. This was where they congregated, ate, socialized. We're in the Great Hall of Penshurst Place in Kent, one of the few well-preserved halls in all of Britain. The Great Hall at Aber Wyvern would have looked something like this. For meals, the Lord, Lady, and their important guests would have sat at the higher table. Everyone would sit on one side so that the servants could serve more easily from the other. Everything except soup and sauce was eaten with the fingers. Bowls and even wine cups were shared with the person sitting next to you. That must have made good table manners essential. Oh, good 
protocol was quite rigid. A medieval Emily Post wrote, wash your hands in the morning and, if there is time, your face. Which is exactly what I tell my daughter. Use a napkin and handkerchief to wipe your mouth, not your hands. And eat with three fingers only and don't gorge. Don't pick your teeth with your knife or wipe your hands on the tablecloth. Well, it sounds like good advice. Uh, don't butter your bread with your fingers. But there are so many rules to remember, it, it could make you lose your appetite. And don't spit on the table or over it. I wasn't going to. I should hope not. After the meal, the entertainment began. Musicians performed on lutes or harps. There were jokes, stories, epic poems and historical tales. Children listened to legends and fables. There were tables for backgammon, chess or dice. And when the weather was good, one could go outside for bowling or falconry. In bad weather, everyone gathered around the fire for warmth and to ward off the gloom. By the standards of the day, castle residents lived in luxury, especially when you consider the lot of the Welsh peasants. They lived in meagre wooden shacks, slept in crowded communal beds, and often finished up the day cold, hungry, and exhausted from so many hours of strenuous labor. Now, not all the people of Wales were peasants or lived in poverty, but for the most part, their standard of living hardly matched the castle life. But there was another way of life, somewhere between these two extremes, that was growing and becoming the most influential force in medieval society, and that was the life in the towns. We're inside a restored medieval house at the Weald and Downland Open Air Museum in Sussex. Because they were built of wood and not stone, buildings this old are rather rare and hard to find. This is close to what the interior of a craftsman's or shopkeeper's house in Aber Wyvern would have looked like. This is a timber-framed structure, and the spaces between the uprights are filled with wattle and daub. Wattle is a woven lattice of sticks which is covered over on both sides with daub, a mixture of mud, cow dung, and straw. A stone in the center of the floor served as a hearth for heating and cooking and assured the constant danger of fire. These houses, like the castles and rural huts, were damp, drafty, and often overcrowded. There was no glass for the windows, and the running water we saw in the castle was unheard of. Keeping clean was a continual challenge. So was eating well. Diets were unbalanced and not very nutritious. The water wasn't always sanitary, making the threat of deadly disease even greater. But despite all of that, so much of what we now see in Western civilization begins here, in the medieval town. It had its own set of municipal laws, its own guilds to regulate crafts and trade, and its own elected officials who were usually the leading merchants. Merchants, shopkeepers, and other members of this new middle class were fast becoming a force to be reckoned with. King Edward, in his time, worked closely with this force for mutual benefit. Sheep could be raised in the hills around Aberwyvern. Wool was a lucrative trade item. It could be sheared, carded, woven, spun, and dyed there, then sold either in England or in Europe for a handsome profit. An enterprise like that would need a town to support it, and this naturally gave the king added incentive for his military campaign in Wales. While the strong stone walls, low taxes, and the promise of a better life gave many common people their own incentive to settle in a place like Aberwyvern. In October of 1288, more than five years after Master James set out the first boundary markers, Aberwyvern Castle was finally completed. The entire outside of the castle was whitewashed, making it look as if it had been carved from a single gleaming piece of stone. I have now turned my attention to the town. Only the English will be allowed to settle here at first, as His Majesty wants it to be an outpost of loyalty in this rebellious region. And with the promise of low rents and other enticements, the town will attract a goodly number of established, industrious people. Then, once a person owns a house, he would certainly want to protect it if the town and castle were ever attacked. I decided to settle in the town. And since I was one of the first, I got a building lot close to the well. Soon, houses spread all up and down the main streets. My house has a ground floor of packed earth covered with reeds. I covered the small window openings with oiled sheepskin to keep out the chill. And we depend upon our fire 
for both heat and light. Trading in wool's been strong in Europe, they say. And the hills outside of town are covered during the day with aber wyvern sheep. We hope that as we continue to grow, King Edward will grant us a charter, so we can hold a yearly fair like the one at Chester. That would bring merchants from all over, especially for our wool. Maybe even Italians from across the sea. Imagine, the oh, Italians in Aber Wyvern. Here is Thomas the Shoemaker's shop. And over there's my close friend, Oliver the Tailor. <laughs> Looks like he's opening up his shutters to start business for the day. As the number of shops has increased, some locations have become a bit more desirable than others. Though we like him well enough, no one wants to spot behind Matthew the Butcher's shop. Oh, that's Robert the Barber's place. We aren't large enough for a full-time physician, so we count on Robert to cure all manner of ills by bleeding out the bad humours. The man blowing the horn over there is the town skyard, who will take your livestock out to be grazed. Hey, mind the window! <laughs> that's one of Lord Kevin's servants on his way to the castle. And that's where I'm headed to. Now that I'm an official smith there. Andrew had a right to be proud of the new castle. Everyone in the town was impressed. But whether the elegant Lady Catherine would be impressed when she arrived was another matter entirely. Being bound by the duties attendant upon my station in life, and being my lord's obedient wife, I knew there was no choice but to go and make the best of it. So on April the 23rd, 1289, I arrived at the castle with my ladies-in-waiting, younger children and servants. For much of our married life, I've been away fighting wherever my king needed me. So Catherine has learned to manage the household on her own. She is as important to the proper functioning of our family and property as I am. Master James and my lord spent six years making the castle the strongest in the land. I've set myself to work making it as elegant and comfortable as, as a castle can possibly be. I insisted that Master James install fireplaces in every room of our living quarters, even though it was costly. I think it much to the family's benefit to relax in these smaller, warmer rooms, away from the drafts and noise of the great hall, particularly in the winter when everyone is cooped up inside. I hung the walls with beautiful tapestries from Normandy and Flanders. And I also brought our collection of books from which the tutor Philip teaches our children. I set a great store in education. I oversee the training of our own soldiers. And when there's time, I often join them for riding or hunting. I must oversee all the servants. And though the soldiers may have much leisure time, I can always find something for the servants to do. I was working in the forge on a quiet afternoon in May when a messenger arrived on horseback and asked to see Lord Kevin directly. His message? King Edward was coming for a visit in just a few days. Our household has been thrown into a frenzy of preparation. And as I think back longingly to those glittering visits to the royal court, 
I am determined to make His Majesty's stay one that will not soon be forgotten. First, there is the matter of cleaning the castle. All of it. Then, accommodation. Lord Kevin and I will relinquish our own apartment for the King's use. Of course, we in turn will move to the steward's quarters. He to the Chamberlains, the Chamberlain to the Marshals, the Marshal to the Butlers, and so on. The townspeople, meanwhile, are particularly excited about the royal arrival. King Edward is making his entrance through town so that we can all catch a glimpse of his royal highness. Naturally, all business has stopped. It's not every day you get to see a king. In the evening, we held a great feast for his majesty. of the King's visit is not entirely social. Though the Welsh countryside has been relatively quiet of late, the King warned me that Prince Dabith of Gwynedd is raising an army for an assault on all the English strongholds in Wales. His Majesty and I discuss strategy long into the night. chess, which dates from about the time of Lord Kevin's castle, is a fairly accurate representation of medieval warfare. Battles were usually small by modern standards, and the real-life ratio between knights and their aides and squires, or pawns, was pretty close to what we see on this board. Check. Just as in the game, killing your opponent wasn't so much the object as cornering him and leaving him without options. Which I just did. Checkmate. So you did. Let's get back to the real thing. This is Harlech, one of Edward's castles that actually went through a bloody siege. In those days, this was the dry moat. And in order to reach the gatehouse, you climbed the causeway and crossed the drawbridge, very much the way I placed it at Aber Wyvern. The whole concept of castle construction was to give the defender every possible advantage. And that began with the high ground on which they built. If there happened to be water or mountains too, so much the better. Even today, it looks impregnable. And during the rebellion of 1294, only 37 men held off an entire army here. The first defense was the drawbridge. It spanned the moat and connected to the end of the causeway. There were weights under this end. And when the supports were pulled out, this end dropped down into a pit, and that end swung up. But even if you could get across the moat, when the bridge was up, it became a solid door. That's right. And there were also soldiers on either side of the gatehouse and above the main entrance. Oh, yes, I see. They were also protected by heavy wooden doors. And behind each pair of doors was a heavy oak drawbar, which slid across here and into that slot over there. A portcullis slid up and down in these grooves. Arrows could be shot through here. A second portcullis was here. A second pair of doors was here. And another drawbar across here. Now, if for any reason an attacking army was able to break through the gate, Sarah, you be the Welsh army and attack my castle. I don't know about that. So it's to be English against Welsh again, is it? Just to make a point, for the sake of history, I think I'd rather have your part. David! I'm all ready for you. 
I think I know how the Welsh must have felt. Of course. All right, now, come on forward, pretending you've made it over the drawbridge and through the outer gate. Assuming I could. And Master James was trying to make sure you couldn't, but let's say you did. Very well, I battered my way through the door. So you have. And as soon as you did, I dropped the portcullis behind you. Now you're trapped between two portcullises, and my archers can get you through the arrow loops. Checkmate. Now I can dump boiling water, burning coals, stones, possibly even a dead cat on you through this opening, called a murder hole. I can see why. You can also see what a mess you'd be in. Well, of course, you had all the advantages. That's what King Edward was paying for. Then let's say I knew enough not to come through the gate and instead built a wooden siege tower up against the wall. Then I'd dump burning straw down on you and set the tower on fire. All right, then. Two can play at this game. What if I just sit outside and wait for you to starve? Well, I might get hungry after a while, but don't forget I've got reinforcements on the way. Then let's say I dug a tunnel under the castle wall and came in by surprise. You'd be a very good general, Miss Bullen. Then that is the best way. I didn't say that. All of these methods were difficult and risky, including that one. But the fact that they were even tried says something about the tremendous strength of these castles. Well, if they had to be built that strong, it must also say something about the spirit and determination of the Welsh people. Absolutely right. They were a fiercely proud, brave and independent people. And any English monarch who forgot that did so at his own peril. As part of his program in 1284, King Edward I named his son, who was born at Carnarvon, to be the first Prince of Wales. And ever since that time, the eldest son of every English monarch has had the title of Prince of Wales. Sarah, do you know what the king's first gift to his son was? Let me guess. A toy castle. You've got it. Let's get on with our story. Throughout the night, Lord Kevin's soldiers stood watch from the highest towers, while merchants, craftsmen, and farmers took turns manning the town wall. In the waters around the castle, Welsh ships prevented escape or new supplies reaching the English. And as the first light of dawn broke over the mountains, Prince Davith and his troops grimly marched toward Abba Wyvern. What lay in our way, we destroyed. The flour mill, the livestock barns, farmhouses. I ordered all the grain fields put to the torch. No longer will we suffer the presence of the cursed English in our land. the town wall. Then, house by house, we fought up toward the castle wall. A few fortunate townspeople made it into the castle ahead of their Welsh pursuers, who were trapped in the gateway between the portcullises.
From high atop the gatehouse tower to the inner ward, Lord Kevin watched the destruction and slaughter. If I could only send forces out to help the brave townsmen on the front line. But if I leave the castle without defences, the whole siege will be lost. And with the Welsh army closing in, I cannot open the gates for any more people escaping the carnage. But now, the battle has come to us. Outside the castle walls, Davith's men assembled in force, preparing their siege towers and catapults. Inside the castle, archers stood poised, ready to unleash the first wave of arrows as the attackers came within their range. My plan has been to cut off the castle from the land while our ships cut it off from the sea and to starve Kevin into surrender. But when my messenger came with news that King Edward had dispatched a large force from the north, I knew we could not wait. They reached the wall. As one attacker fell, another took his place. Boulders, boiling water and arrows kept some away, while others had to be blocked directly on the point of a sword or axe. My sappers are digging a tunnel under the wall. When they finish, the log supporting it will be burned. Then the tunnel will collapse, the wall with it, and we can storm the castle and send the English dog straight to hell. Inside the inner ward, part of the barracks became a hospital as the wounded were brought down from the walls. The fighting at the castle wall continued without let up for three days as each exhausted ship was replaced by the next. This morning, news has reached me that the troops of King Edward are less than a day away. Now we must make our final move. I am ordering the tunnel burn. Throughout it all, my castle remained secure and impenetrable, and the wall over the sapper's tunnel proved too strong and thick to fall. The Welsh attackers have done their worst, but they were no match for our castle's defences. Duffy knows the advantage is now mine. We have no way of smashing their defences before the English reinforcements arrive. The best we can hope for is a stalemate, to keep Kevin in check. The tide of battle has turned! Finally, I have Davith on the run! I am ordering a retreat. We have no choice. We will need greater strength to drive these cursed English from our homeland. Until we do, the struggle will never cease. We know that God and right are on the side of Wales, and we are willing to die for our land. There were more battles over Abba Wyvern. But in the years that followed, Welsh families began to take up residence outside the town wall. During fairs and on market days, they came in to sell and trade their goods.
Eventually, Welsh and English lived side by side, and the town became too large for the wall that enclosed it. When the Welsh became part of the business life of the area, the castle built to subdue them became unnecessary. Thus, the full measure of King Edward's victory wasn't achieved until almost 200 years after his death. By that time, Lord Kevin's mighty fortress stood empty and roofless from neglect. And when travelers came to ask directions to Aberwyvern, they meant not the derelict old castle, but the thriving town. There weren't many castles built in Britain during the 14th century. There was neither the resources nor the need. Wales was successfully, though reluctantly, brought under English rule, and the next steps had to be economic and social rather than military. The great age of English and European castle building was, for the most part, over. The 13th century, remarkable for its scholastic, economic, judicial, and architectural achievements, faded into a 14th century of more frequent wars, disease, famine, and disorganization. By the end of the 1300s, the European population had been cut nearly in half by an enemy the people of the Middle Ages dreaded far more than all the armies the most powerful princes could muster, the Black Death. No castle wall could keep out the plague, a terrifying infectious disease that spread through Europe beginning in 1348. Nor could any castle withstand the introduction of gunpowder, cannon, and other improvements to the business of war making. So Edward's castles were abandoned and ignored except by local builders who used them as quarries for stone. But the great castle here at Conway, which happens to be my favorite, is still a powerful and stirring reminder of the past in the midst of this bustling town. I can't help thinking that in the nearly 700 years since Edward's time, so much has changed. Methods of warfare, outlooks on life. But these castles are still here. I wonder if anything in our own civilization will last as long. In spite of the romantic images they conjure up, we mustn't overlook the fact that castles symbolize a long-standing and less flattering human trait, man's apparently insatiable desire for conflict and conquest. But in these castles, there is an optimistic irony, perhaps even a lesson to be learned. For as impressive as the ruins are, they are, after all, ruins, neglected machines of war surrounded by life, a life they helped create, but which has survived them and which continues to flourish long after each invincible fortress quickly and quietly succumbed to obsolescence.
Major funding for this program has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding has been provided by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Jacob and Charlotte Lehrman Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS.